Hi, this is Peter Clayton. Welcome to a Future of Work episode of Total Picture Media. My special guest today is Jeffrey Wald, an entrepreneur who has started three technology companies, the most recent being Work Market, sold to ADP in 2018 for uh, undisclosed millions or possibly billions of dollars. He remains uh, with ADP and is the author of a new book titled The End of Jobs, The Rise of On-Demand Workers and Agile Corporations. And that's the topic of our conversation today. I was introduced to Jeff by Jessica Miller Merrill, who interviewed Jeff for her Workology podcast, which I happen to edit, and I'll put a link in the show notes. So Jeff, thank you for joining me today. I've really been looking forward to our conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, unfortunately, it was not billions uh, to (laughs) ADP, but uh, it did get well over the 100 million mark. So it was a good outcome for our investors and for our team. Absolutely. So so here's a quote from your book. Uh, No more than 52 articles per year. So let's start by having you uh, give us a brief background uh, of work market and the problem it solves for companies that want to hire freelance talent. So work market is enterprise software that enables corporations to efficiently and compliantly manage their freelance populations. The efficiently and compliantly, Peter, are are the key words in there uh, as are as is freelancers uh, by creating efficiencies on people organizing, managing, and paying that freelance population, we allow companies to engage more and more freelancers. And compliantly has to do with the very complex, contradictory, and confusing tangle of regulations that govern the freelance workforce, including one company believing that 52 assignments per year was their limit. One thing I really appreciated uh in reading your book, the first chapter of The End of Jobs really dives into historically work in the United States. And the the sections on unions and regulations were fascinating to me. And would you mind telling our viewers a little bit about the Ludlow Massacre? Well, I mean, first I would start with this. You know, the main reason for writing the book was a frustration with people that made predictions about the future of work that were not grounded in evidence. And quite frankly, I have a frustration with anybody that says almost anything if it isn't grounded in evidence, but we'll leave that aside for a second. In the future of work, there are three very large portions of evidence that in my mind, you have to take into account when making these predictions. One is the history of work, how companies, workers, and society come together to produce the goods and the service in a sustainable way. Two is the data, and that data has some historic context as to what the historic trends and patterns are that have persisted through the history of work, but also the data around the world of work today. And the third is how companies actually engage workers. There is this false assumption that companies just say, oh, let's just find the cheapest worker, meeting adjourned. That is not how companies actually do very complex workforce planning. And so when we think about the rise of robots and AI that many refer to as the first, the fourth industrial revolution and the book I call it the first services revolution, it is important to understand how did companies, workers, and society, how did the data, how did companies actually engaging workers get impacted by the first three industrial revolutions, mechanization, electrification, and computerization, because companies tend to gain a huge amount of power leading to things like the Ludlow Massacre which was just simply the U.S. Army opening fire on a camp of workers that were striking. And, you know, 200 200 men, women, and children were killed. That just had to be owned by John D. Rockefeller, correct? There you go. And so the, the importance of understanding these events of the past is vital because history does tend to rhyme. And to think that everything's going to be completely different this time is very, very dangerous. So do I think that it's going to happen exactly as it did? Of course not. But it's very important to understand how we have tackled these problems in the past when we think about how we tackle them in the future. Can you um, give me some explanation for the fact that labor unions have all but collapsed here in the United States? Well, I would challenge the collapse. Certainly as a percent of the labor force, they continue to represent fewer and fewer Americans. The number of Americans that belong to a union has actually been pretty stable over the last 30 years at about 15 million. It's just 
they're not growing and the rest of the workforce is. So the, that's the first kind of challenge on the word collapse. The, the second would be the morphing of the union movement. Now, whether it is new types of unions that are springing up, and we have a lot of very interesting things to think about there, but not a lot of data yet. The most important thing to think about the union movement morphing is the fight for 15. Look, this started as a union-led movement in Seattle, led by the SEIU and a brilliant guy named David Rolf and his team. And it morphed into an activist grassroots-led campaign across the United States by mostly non-union members that were bringing forward this idea of the union and collective bargaining to say, well, we should have a $15 minimum wage. That is a basic need for a living wage. And so those campaigns led to tremendous number of states adjusting their minimum wage laws, not directly to 15, but on a slow scale to get to 15 in the near future. And those are movements that, while generated at the beginning by the union movement, became worker-wide movements. So those lead me to optimism about the fate for of workers in this workers versus company balance that I try to articulate in the book. Yeah, but it seems to me, Jeff, that your book really focuses on skilled freelance talent. I mean, I just hired uh, a WordPress expert at $55 an hour, and it was worth every penny I spent. But then you have the unskilled workers who are the Instacarts uh, of the world who seem to me to be getting screwed left and right. So you are right. I mean, the vast majority of work at work market is highly skilled freelancers. And I think we need to be mindful when we think about the regulatory environment. Regulation is needed when there's a huge power imbalance between the parties and the party that has the risk of being taken advantage of needs protection. And in the case of an Instacart worker, an Uber driver, people that are effectively sometimes, you know, I've seen some studies that say that after expenses, an Uber driver is making $6 an hour, that is not acceptable and regulation needs to be brought to bear. For someone making 50, 55, 75, $100 an hour, I'm not sure that they need protection. And there is a healthy debate to be had about where is that line that we need to say, you know what, this is just a free market transaction. The freelancer doesn't need to take the job paying $100 an hour, but if they want to, it's there. I'm not sure that the US government needs to intervene on somebody that is making $100 an hour times 2,000 hours, $200,000 a year. I think that person is just fine. But to your point, a large number of freelancers are in the other category and a lot needs to be done for them and quite frankly is being done. So you can look at you know California's AB5 rule as the tip of the iceberg here. And there is a lot happening underneath the water in states all over the country that if not for COVID would have enacted similar pieces of legislation. So we will see as this world of freelance continues to evolve. Yeah, I think there is a correlation between the, let's just call it the de decline in union, i.e. manufacturing jobs, which historically have been where the union is the most strong, mm -hmm. and the long-term trend, as you write, of 25 to 54-year-olds without college degrees dropping out of the labor force. But where are they going, Jeff? Well, that I think is, uh, it's not exactly a mystery. We have a lot of data here. They're going on to disability roles. The disability roles have increased uh, almost 300% over the period of time where we saw a lot of manufacturing jobs leave the United States. We see a lot of long-term unemployed and a lot of people on other types of federal benefits. And I will tell you, Peter, what, what scares me the most as we think about the movement in the manufacturing sector. So we went from 20 million manufacturing jobs at our peak in 1980 to 12 million, manu 12 million manufacturing jobs. And politicians can rant and rave as much as they want about trade policy, environmental policy. The vast, vast, vast majority of those jobs were lost to robots, that robots were doing the jobs because as a country, we produced nearly more than double the industrial output we had in 1980, we just do it with 40% fewer workers. And here's what scares me about all that. 
is those 8 million workers, we did a terrible job as a society helping those workers to transition to the industries, the geographies, the functions that were growing tremendously. And if that is replicated, as we think about the upwards of 25 million jobs that may get lost over the next 20 years, we do it at our peril. That the transition, when we think about transitions historically, they always end up in a better place. We end up with ever more jobs, higher standards of living, working fewer hours. That is, those are historical facts. But what are also historical facts is the transition periods are very, very difficult, very tumultuous. In some cases, revolutions occur during these transition periods, not in the United States, uh, in Europe. And so to think that this transition will be a good transition and will end up a better place is to really understand history and to really study data. To think that it will be easy is folly. And the more difficult it becomes, it is because we did not provide the retraining and other kinds of upskilling necessary to the workers that were displaced. Because plenty of jobs will be created. But if we can't move workers from industries that are dying and industries that are growing, from functions that are dying to functions that are growing, we do so at our peril. Now there are apps for everything, TaskRabbit, Upwork, uh, Instacart, Uber Eats, mm -hmm. Rover, which is dog walking with 1099s. Uh, yeah. How are all of these gig work platforms changing freelance work? Well, honestly, they're changing them at the margin. One of the things that I, I talk about in the book is, let's look at the data. These are still a very tiny percentage of the freelance workforce writ large. They have an outsized impact because they're on the headlines and we have, you know, have them on our phones. But when I think about the Rovers, the WAGs, the TaskRabbits, all great companies, I think about the movement of informal jobs into the formal economy. I don't see a transformation of the labor force. To take our friends at Rover and WAG as an example, people use dog walkers well before Rover and WAG existed. They paid their dog walkers in cash. The vast majority still do. Now, Peter, if I were to ask you how many of the people that pay their dog walkers in cash at the end of the year, give the dog walker a nice Christmas present, and with that Christmas present, give them an IRS form 1099, I think we both can take a pretty quick guess as to how many people are giving their dog walker an IRS form 1099. Whereas through Rover and WAG, as you pointed out, people do receive an IRS form 1099. That is no change that has occurred in the economy from a structural standpoint. It is the movement of an informal cash transaction into the formal economy, a digitized transaction that is recorded. That is a very good thing for a host of reasons. Moving gray market transactions into the formal economy is great, but they don't represent structural changes. And when we think about the task rabbits and things like that, that is what is basically occurring. Handy and other apps like that. Uber, somewhat different. All right, Uber, you are basically taking the transportation, the taxi industry, and moving it from a company-based 1099 structure where companies would have the medallions and then they would pay their workers in a 1099 to democratizing it, which has led to very significant structural changes in how we maybe get from point A to point B. But it's important to remember that Uber represents less than 1%. Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Postmates, Instacart. This is, you know, very small percents of the on-demand workforce writ large. That being said, however, there are a lot, there are a large pop population of people in places like Las Vegas who spend their entire day driving for Uber or Lyft. So in, in your opinion, are they employees or are they on-demand workers? In my opinion, I don't know enough about how Uber operates in each different jurisdiction to have a definitive opinion. That said, when I think about Uber dictating whether or not you uh, are getting a ride or not getting a ride, right? Their algorithm will determine if Peter gets the ride or if Jeff gets the ride. When I think about the fact that Uber determines the rates at which the rides are set, 
when I think about a host of other things that Uber does from a behavioral standpoint, I start to think that looks like an employee. But then when I think about the fact that you're providing your own training and your own equipment as a driver, when I think about the fact that you're working for Uber and for Lyft and maybe for DoorDash and Uber Eats and a bunch of other places, when I think about the fact that you are within your power to accept a job or not accept a job, that does tend to look like an independent contractor. What becomes very important are the outcomes here, right? Are these workers being taken advantage of and are they earning less than they would if they were protected by regulation? That study that showed an Uber driver earning less than $6 an hour, then regulation needs to be brought to bear. Whether that regulation is a misclassification regulation, the way we see California AB5 try to be, or if it's regulation that says, all right, look, this is a free market transaction between two parties, but we can't have one of the parties making six bucks an hour. So maybe there are minimum thresholds. I don't think that the blunt force of the regulation to say employee or independent contractor is the right piece of legislation. It is too, it is too designed for a different era. There are a host of different regulatory responses that are different than we'll make them all employees. And so I'm not a fan of anybody that comes on and just says, well, they ought to be employees, but they're not employees in a lot of ways. And so it, it begs for a different regulatory framework that is unfortunately too complex for our current political environment. It, it, and like you said, it, it is incredibly complex. So let's discuss the title of your book, uh, The End of Jobs. It seems that more and more companies are adopting strategies to bring in contract workers. Uh, Jeff, has the pandemic accelerated the shift from full-time employee to on-demand, to an on-demand workforce? So short answer to that question is we don't know. Hmm. We don't know, and I would argue probably not. Here's what I'll say. First, you know, the title of the book was meant to say the end of the job as we knew it, the nine to five, one office, one manager job. That job is ending, not jobs ending where we're all becoming Uber drivers, not jobs ending where the robots were taking all of our jobs. So if we were to look at the on-demand economy and we were to look at basically any data source, the idea that the on-demand economy has grown so tremendously over the last 10 to 15 years has literally no support. I can think of two of the myriad of studies, two that have shown growth. Many show a flat on-demand economy. A few show a shrinking on-demand economy, like the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The US government, their data sets would tell us the on-demand economy has shrunk over the last 15 years. Hmm. But the two that show growth show very small growth, you know, 3% market share gain over a 10 year period. Okay. And I happen to believe that those data sets, those I think to me are the most accurate pictures. I think the most well thought out studies that were done. So we are seeing very slight growth in this market. That is a very cogent argument. An argument could be made that we're seeing no growth in this argument, uh, in this market, and I would accept that too. I happen to err on the side of this slight growth. However, that growth, and that growth is driven, as you say, by companies wanting to, what I would say is variableize their workforce, to take their largest cost, which is labor, which is predominantly a fixed cost, and turn it into more of a variable cost where they can turn it on and turn it off. And certainly, the mass economic dislocation we saw in March, April, and June, where companies that were more agile could very quickly take their costs down because their revenue was dropping precipitously and they were able to match their costs and therefore lose less money than the companies who couldn't adapt very quickly and had to take different steps with the Warren Act and severance and a host of other things. I'm not saying one's better than the other, but they are distinctly different. And companies that had a more fixed labor cost looked at the ones that were more variable and said, oh, well, I want to do more of that. And so that might, and again, we don't have the data, but that might yield more companies using more on-demand labor, maybe. That is the tailwind pushing this market forward, but it is being pushed forward in the face of a very powerful headwind, and that is California's AB5. And again, the other states that will 
once they get back to steady state, pass similar legislation. And that is pushing the market down. And so if you had to ask me which is going to prevail, Peter, I would tell you over the next 10 years, I think the on-demand market will shrink. Because here's what I can also tell you now, now we'll get into anecdote and stories. As the person running work market for a 10 year period, I had every incentive for every company to move more workers to an on-demand context. And I sat in maybe a thousand sales meetings. Here is what I never once heard, never once over those thousand sales meetings. Hey, we're gonna take our W2 workers and move them to 1099, so we need your software. No company ever has ever said that. That to me, I should say. And if they were doing it, I would hear about it because I am the only piece of software to manage. <laughs> but here's a conversation I have heard maybe a hundred times. Hey, you know, we have all these 1099s and we're getting very uncomfortable with the regulatory environment and we want to move them to W-2 workers. So either we're going to stop having a conversation with you about using your software so we can end the sales cycle, or we currently use your software and we're gonna stop using it because we're gonna convert all the 1099s to W-2s, to which we would say, actually, you can use our software to manage your W-2s as long as it's in a task-based context. So we didn't lose many customers over it, but we saw a lot of customers transition from 1099 payments to W-2 payments. Those are things that actually happened versus the notion that people have that companies come in and go, Oh, I just took this thing called an Uber. Let's do that with our workforce. That hasn't happened that I've ever seen. And again, I am at the center of this. So I'm highly confident in saying that if somebody were doing it, we would know about it. So those two things get balanced out against each other. And again, my analysis, my gut tells me that regulation wins and that this market shrinks, not tremendously, but on the margin shrinks over the next 10 years. That's really interesting. And, you know, speaking about uh, regulations and, and the complexity, um, in the end of jobs, you write that many of today's labor laws and regulations are more than 100 years old and were drafted in response to very different needs. So to, to add to this mess, Jeff, each state has its own definition of employees and freelancers. Yeah. And I guess that keeps a lot of lawyers busy, but, you know, wouldn't updating and streamlining some of this uh, benefit both employers and employees? Yes, yes, and yes. Yeah. That, those are the answers to those questions. I mean, Peter, you're talking about a federal piece of legislation, the Fair Labor Standards Act, that defines an employee as a person that is employed by an employer. Well, what does that mean? That's a Monty <laughs> Python. <laughs> That's what that, That's what is. that means. And then to your point, you have 50 different states. And within those states, by the way, you have different regulatory body, bodies. You have the Department of Labor, you have the Unemployment Office, the Worker Comp Board, who all may have different definitions themselves. So you are dealing with hundreds of definitions of just who is an employee in the United States. And as a business, how do I run my company if what I do in Wisconsin? for their state workers comp board is okay. But in Tennessee, their unemployment office thinks it's not okay. It's very difficult to run a company that way. And so when I talk about the regulatory construct, I will often say it is complex, confusing, and contradictory. And that is very, very difficult for businesses to operate in. And so businesses would benefit and workers would benefit because companies, would love to train their independent contractors because it helps them to get better independent contractors. It helps the independent contractor to get better skill sets. But as a company, you can't train the independent contractor because if right. you do, it starts to look like an employee. So as a company that wants to engage independent contractors, I want to do something that's good for me. I want to do something that's good for the, for the worker, but I can't. This is what I talk about when I say you have these blunt instruments of independent contractor, or employee that were predicated on a very different economic structure, a very different economic environment. And so it would be ideal if we put forward a very clear, very quantified metric of what the difference is between the two, or maybe create three or four different classifications. Because what we have today isn't working for companies, it isn't great for workers, 
and there are solutions to these problems. But to pretend that they're simple solutions is incredibly naive. They are not simple, they are complex. And they do incorporate a host of different jurisdictions. So I, I, don't, I don't know what the magic wand to even wave here is, yeah. but there is a much better way to do this. Back in February and March, when the brakes got slammed on everything and everybody, there were all of these news reports that came out about some states who are still using computers that run on COBOL, you know, which is like, what, yeah. you know, and, and digging people out of retirement who can write COBOL because they needed, you know, I, it just blows my mind. I mean, that is, that is a, a separate but equally horrifying issue around government infrastructure and the efficiency of government services. I mean, it is horrifying that people could not log into a state unemployment website to fill out a claim. That is a mind-blowingly simple process when compared to the incredibly complex thing that enterprise software can do. And that is just a failing on state governments all across this country for not modernizing their systems. And it is, it is not, I shouldn't say, across this country, because there are some states that I think did a wonderful job of it. But when you look at something like Florida, it, it's just, it, it is unacceptable. And the citizens of the state of Florida should be horrified, even if they aren't people that are collecting unemployment, that their state government is that inefficient and that antiquated in its technology infrastructure. The, the fact remains that payroll and income taxes make up about 90% of government tax receipts. So Correct. the feds in most states have a vested interest in keeping um, as many W-2 workers as possible. So, you know, something else you wrote very extensively about in your book is co-employment claims. Mm -hmm. Can you unpack this for us? So people talk about the on-demand economy and they always think the freelancer, the Uber driver. Again, the Uber driver is somebody we actually see on a very regular basis, at least I do, because uh, I live in Manhattan, I don't own a car. But Uber's on our phones and it's on the front pages. But Uber represents, again, a very, very small percentage because that freelancer is actually the minority of the on-demand economy. The majority of the on-demand economy, and on-demand to me, and we define it in the book as someone that is not your W-2, the majority of the on-demand economy are temp workers, are people that are receiving an IRS form W-2. So they do have access to the social safety net and unemployment and workers' comp but they're receiving a W-2 from a staffing firm or a payrolling firm. And so not a lot of people appreciate that Kelly Services is actually the largest employer in the United States because they issued over 3 million W-2s last year. And that is a very different construct. So a temp worker can sit side by side by somebody that is a full-time W-2 of yours. They can perform the same tasks and functions it's just they're a temp worker. The concerns around co-employment is that you treat the temp worker too much like the employee, and therefore you're on the hook for any benefits that you give to that employee should have been given to that temp worker. And so that is what is known as co-employment claims. It's that your employee, your temp worker is viewed as a full-time employee, and therefore whatever incremental benefits you gave to the employee that the temp firm didn't give. To that worker, you now are on the hook for. Yeah, and I can give you a very specific example of how this is screwing everybody up. Um, a good friend of mine, John Sumser, told me recently that, uh, you know, because so much of work is being done remotely today, uh, companies are really using Microsoft Teams extensively, mm -hmm. but the temp workers don't have access to Microsoft Teams. And I think it really relates exactly to what you were talking about. If they give them access to Microsoft Teams within the organization, then does that make them an employee? One of my favorite examples comes from one of my favorite humans, which is a guy named Don Weinstein, who might be the smartest guy I've met. And he is the head of global product and technology at ADP, He's a former global head of strategy and corporate development, and led the purchase of work market, which makes him one of my favorite people in the world. In addition. Oh, sure. <laughs> to a person I admire, but he tells a story on stage about a global security event. ADP has, as far as I'm aware, the most impressive global security organization of any private company, 
um, or of any company because you know we move trillions of dollars around the globe. And so we've got these huge knocks and whatever, and we're tracking every movement because you, you got to protect those pipes. He tells a story about a global security event because the global security organization is also in charge of the safety of ADP's people. And there was, you know, a big hurricane or something, and he's in a staff meeting with a bunch of team members, and half the people got, you know, a ping on their phone, are you okay? And the other half didn't, because the other half were temps, and they weren't in that system. And these are people that are leading parts of a very big project, and they're all looking, and they're going, so you guys don't care if I'm okay? And clearly, Don cares very much if they're okay or not, but they weren't included in the system because they're temps. But Don didn't view them that way. He viewed them as members of his team. And so it is a tricky, tricky line to be walked. Yeah. And, you know, in uh, viewing your LinkedIn profile, you serve on an awful lot of boards. So can, can you please explain the boardroom friction that exists today between the CFO, the CHRO, the COO, the CLO, and the CEO? Well, I think it's best encapsulated in one of my favorite labor force jokes, which is the CFO says, well, we need to cut this training and development budget because what if we spend all this money and the people leave? And the CEO says, what if we don't spend the money and they stay? So <clears throat> I think that you have a lot of tensions in, in, in that boardroom on a number of fronts. You know, you certainly have the legal department being very worried about risk and being worried about that worker misclassification claim. And we run up against that all the time at work market where you have the operations team, which are very focused on efficiency. And they say, we're trying to manage all these freelancers and we're doing it on a spreadsheet. And we don't understand who's where, who signed what legal agreement, who's working on what, who's good at what. It takes us eight weeks to pay a freelancer. And that's crazy. They're not doing it because they're trying to screw the freelancer. It's just moving the paperwork from department to department to get approvals and get GL codes and PO numbers and into accounts payable and then getting it all into the right system before a check can be cut. That's crazy. And the people running the service organization want to move it more efficiently. But the people in HR and procurement and legal need to make sure, are these really freelancers? And what becomes interesting, Peter, is that in our sales cycles, a lot of the times they end up becoming the biggest champions because they know that there are rules and limits that they could put in place to insulate them. But if, it, if the work's being done in a spreadsheet, you'll never be able to track it. And the example actually you cited from the book is one of my favorite. Very large media company, the largest on the planet, had this rule that 52 assignments per year was the line they felt determined employee versus freelancer. Now, why they thought that, I have no idea. There is nothing from a case law nor statutory standpoint that says anything about 52 assignments per year. Doesn't matter to me, right? My job is not to determine the rules and the limits. My job is to build the software that helps companies be efficient and compliant. And here's what happened pre-work market. Every single day, somebody at their company would get their 53rd, 58th, 72nd, 124th assignment because they were being managed in a spreadsheet and the person sending the work out had no idea how many assignments this person had done already. And so they were accidentally violating all the rules despite legal procurement and HR, this boardroom conflict coming and saying, don't do more than 52. This is why we do it. Everybody please know and doing training and sending memos and all the other stuff. But they knew once they implemented software to manage efficiency and compliance, they could just type in 52 assignments per drop down week or year, save, and that's it. Now it's a metaphysical impossibility for that person in the service organization that just wants to get the work done and they go to send another assignment to Jane and then the system goes, you can't send another assignment to Jane for three weeks because of her 52 week rolling period, she's already at 52 assignments. You have to wait for her last assignment to roll off. And they go, okay, great. I'll send it to Jane, I'll send it to Sally, go. And so they can get their job done quickly, which is what they want, and the people managing risk can get what they want. And that is how software can help ease those boardroom tensions because the tensions are usually between efficiency and risk. At first I thought Andrew Yang was, uh, was crazy with his proposal for the universal basic income. 
Jeff, I no longer think this is such a crazy idea. What What's your opinion of UBI? So I don't know if UBI is the right public policy and the right creation of a larger social safety net to ease this transition. I think there are, it should be talked about and it should be considered as any proposal should be talked about and considered. And the marketplace of ideas should produce the best outcome for society. I will say this, when you think about UBI, about a year ago, two years ago, before Andrew's presidential campaign really brought this issue to the fore, if you talked about it, people would say, what? No, that's crazy. We can't do that. I'm not going to give everybody $1,000 a month. That, that's just way too big of an increase in the social safety net, in the welfare system, in whatever you want to call that aspect of government spending. You're talking about a huge increase. And I compare it in the book to a conversation that might have happened in the late 1920s in the United States, where somebody says, hey, you know what we should do? We should have a social security program where we're giving a government pension to everybody. We should have unemployment where anyone that loses their job, the government pays them for a little bit. And somebody saying that, their friend might go, what are you, crazy? We will never do that. That is such a huge fundamental restructuring of the social contract that can't happen. And a couple of years later, because of the Great Depression, we had the New Deal legislation that fundamentally altered the social contract in the United States, the economic contract in the United States. And so the point I make in the book is that you don't see that kind of fundamental restructuring outside of huge economic dislocation. And obviously, when I was writing the book, we had no prospect of an economic dislocation. I make the point in the book that a lot of conversations had around the on-demand economy or happened in a concept of a increasing economic growth over an 11-year period, longest period of economic growth in the history of the United States. So it was very difficult. You need to be mindful of where you are in the business cycle when having these conversations. But nobody would have thought we'd have a 40%, 32% contraction of the GDP in a quarter. And it is more likely that you get a program like a UBI or something else like that when society calls for huge change. Uh, I would say fortunately, and fortunately this trend continues, the economic recovery in the United States has been much swifter than anybody thought. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were talking about 7% GDP decline over the annualized, over 2020. Now we're looking at 4% GDP decline massively better picture. We can only hope it continues. Uh, and certainly we hope that we have a vaccine and we're in a post-COVID world sooner rather than later. You believe that healthcare should be decoupled from work, but I don't see any political will to do so. What, what needs to happen to make that a reality, Jeff? Because I completely agree with you. What needs to happen? I think it is something that happens because there's a huge economic shock. I think that we need to acknowledge that we are the only industrialized country that does this, that ties uh, healthcare to employment. I think that the free markets that the market-based system that the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, Obamacare brought to bear, were created in Republican think tanks and why they are so anti-Obamacare is, I just don't understand. It is literally creating a market-based solution for healthcare. So that's mind blowing to me that that this has become the cause of the of the conservative movement. This should be what the conservative movement wants: decouple it from employment and let the market forces allow an individual to own personal responsibility for buying their health care. Everything about that makes sense to me, um, save for making sure that there is affordable quality health care in those markets. In which case, you may need to have a government option in the markets to keep the markets honest because businesses will obviously driven by a profit motive. So I don't pretend that it is simple. Much like employment law, healthcare is incredibly complex. I would argue it's so complex because we have this crazy system tied to employers where they're paying part of my healthcare. And when I go and see a doctor, I'm actually not paying that doctor. My insurance company is paying the doctor. And there seems to be a way through this that is better because we spend more on healthcare than any other country and we don't have better outcomes than any other country. 
So I would hope that there is a simple solution or a comprehensive solution out there. But right now, we can't seem to have basic conversations about what facts are. So until we get past this very toxic political environment, I don't think there'll be any changes. And when I think about my favorite part of the book is chapter 10, where we have all these experts write their views on the future of work. And one of my favorite passages in that is by a guy named William Weissman, who is um, one of the leaders of Littler Mendelssohn, one of the largest labor law firms. And he basically says, all this stuff is too complex. We'll never get our shit together to solve these problems. And so don't expect any, I mean, I'm paraphrasing mightily, right. don't expect any new labor classification, don't expect any new huge social welfare program, don't expect any change in healthcare. The labor markets in 20 years will basically be what the labor markets are now because it's too hard to change all this stuff. And I don't disagree. I hope that that's not the case. But this is a scenario where we have fundamental problems in the United States of America that with the right people in the room with the right incentives, the men and women that run this government, we can come up with better solutions. But I don't hold out any hope for that. Do you think possibly this pandemic may shift some of those attitudes and, you know, kickstart some of these ideas that have been percolating for the last 20 years and are would actually help the country to uh, become re reality? So the short answer is, I hope it doesn't, because the only way it does is if the pandemic persists and we end up with a huge negative GDP over a two-year period. So we would see structural change if the economy got so bad. And so I'm kind of hopeful in one way that we don't see it. What I would say, Peter, is that if we want to tackle these big issues, the first issue to tackle is the election process. If we were to put in place open or nonpartisan primaries, if we were to put in place gerrymandering reform, if we were to put in place mandatory voting, if we were to put in place term limits, those are the things that change the incentives for those men and women that get together at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, that are trying to come up with the long-term solutions that allow for the continued competitiveness of not only the American economy, but the American ideal of democracy and freedom and all these other things that right now is facing another existential threat in the Chinese model. If we change the electoral process, we may well get the kinds of solutions we want whether it's on climate policy, on healthcare, on employment, or other fundamental things that we struggle with as a country. I think the idea that we're going to get a different outcome from the same process does not give me much hope. That somehow enlightened men and women will come in that will solve these long-term problems and make difficult choices one of my favorite quotes was one of the heads of the European Commission saying, we all know what to do. We just don't know how to get reelected if we do it. Well, that's a problem because everybody knows fundamentally what to do. But they're all more focused on keeping their jobs. And I don't have time for that. We need to do these things. And because we need to do them, we need to put in place the incentives for the people making the decisions. So we have a Coke Pepsi problem in this country, right? Where it's to, to both of their benefits to stay in business or a duopoly, basically, mm -hmm. you either buy one version of a sugar drink or another version, basically the same flavor. You know, I, I saw a great quote from a, the longtime CEO of Pepsi, which said, if Coke didn't exist, we'd have to create it. Right. You know, they need each other. And they have no incentive for, uh, for any change in that market. Uh, but it's one of the many reasons I just drink water. You know, one thing that really perked my interest in, in your book was your suggestion for an alumni labor cloud 
um, reminded me of a once great client of Total Picture Media named Select Minds. And I had covered their annual user conference for a couple of years and produced a number of videos and podcasts with their leadership and clients, which included Swiss Re and JP Morgan Chase and IBM and Lockheed Martin and Deloitte and EY. Um, so I'd like you to listen to a podcast excerpt from the founder and CEO, Ann Berkowitz, which I recorded back in 2010, a decade ago. Um, and I'm just going to read this to you so you, you can sure. re respond to it. We started about 10 years ago, launched the idea of a corporate alumni network. This was before the days of social networking, really as a recruiting solution with the idea that in the fact the former employees of a company provided a very rich talent pool, as counterintuitive as that is, either to rehire some of their best players or to leverage relationships of the alumni to drive referrals to other talent. Then over 10 years, we've been doing that. We found that for many sectors, alumni could be clients. They could go to customer organizations as well. So maintaining relationships with those alumni was very good for generally maintaining the brand and keeping former employees informed of the brand, but also to drive referrals of new business and of talent. I'm in violent, violent agreement. <laughs> and the fascination I have is even though it is so clear, the benefits, whether it's a rehire, whether it's engaging as a temp or a freelancer, just on a project basis, whether it's as a referral agent for clients or referral agent for new employees, whether it's as a brand ambassador, there is no reason to not stay in closer touch with the men and women that have been a part of your organization. Every single day, you have institutional knowledge, client knowledge, process knowledge, technical knowledge walking out that door. And if you keep in closer contact with it, you might be able to bring it back in, in any of those contexts. And yet, of the 50,000 companies in the United States that employ greater than 500 workers, where there at least should be some construct for keeping in touch with former people. To my knowledge, only about 350 companies do it in a formalized way. It's just, it's mind blowing to me. We have companies like Select Minds, a company called Eurancore. There are two great software packages, one called Canenza, the other called Enterprise Alumni. And they're fighting tooth and nail with each other over like the Fortune 500 when there is this huge tail of companies that also are engaged uh, that have an incentive to stay in touch. And so few companies do it. And I am perplexed by it, increasingly perplexed. Although some companies do utilize uh, different ADP products to do this. Uh, the fact that it is not a standard thing at every single company is, I believe, something that is about to change. Yeah, Select Minds was acquired by Oracle in September oh. of 2012, okay. and it disappeared within Taleo, <laughs> you know, another another yeah. former Total Picture Media client. So, uh, yeah, I think alumni labor clouds would be a, a really great startup at this point. We shall see. We shall see. I am, you know, ending my time uh, at ADP. Uh, my lockup will end, and uh, you know, I may have one more startup left in me. I think that would be awesome. So, so wrapping up here, Jeff, tell us about the future of work prize competition that you write about in your book. So the future of work prize was my attempt to give an incentive to the 20 men and women that are actually some of the thought leaders and the people shaping the future of work that were kind enough to write essays for me and for the book about what they think the world of work looks like in 2040. And so to have people like William Weissman, who is, I would say, the best and most important labor lawyer in the United States, to have people like Andy Stern, who ran the largest labor union in the United States, Carl Camden, who ran one of the largest staffing firms in the United States, to get them to put forward what they think the world of work looks like in 2040 was such a gift. And I coalesced around the idea after seeing the XPRIZE founder give a talk at an ADP conference to say, oh, well, I'll make this my own little XPRIZE 
and I will put a $10 million uh, prize up. Now, look, I'm not going to award the prize until 2040. So this will be the one context in which I root for inflation. But um, it, uh, it's been such fun working with these 20 people, getting their thoughts and putting them uh, into the book. It makes chapter 10 by far my favorite chapter. I think it's the most interesting chapter. But uh, as a person that took seven years to write his book, it's also my favorite chapter because I didn't have to write it. And so outsource what you can that, that needed to get outsourced. So if you are writing the end of jobs today, would you change anything? It's a really good question. Um, you know, look, I finished the book and we went to content lock in January of 2020. Nice. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. I clearly would change a lot because the impacts of COVID on the future of work are very real. We don't know exactly what they are yet. There is a very clear trend in remote work, and we could spend another hour talking about remote work and the data that we already have on remote work and its impacts on companies, on workers, on office space, on cities. This is all very well codified, and again, huge amounts of data behind it. The on-demand economy, we don't have a lot of data yet. We don't have a lot of data on deglobalization. We don't have a lot of data on concentration. We don't have a lot of data on how COVID is impacting the uptake of robots and AI. But in all three of those, deglobalization, concentration, and robotics, we have a strong sense that COVID has accelerated existing trends towards those things. But until we have data, it's tough to say. So I generally will say to people that there's been huge impacts. We just don't know exactly what they are yet. We can't prove what they are yet, but we have a really good sense of them. And so I would spend a lot of time exploring those things, which means I'd still be writing and I'd still be researching because it's going to take us at least another couple months, you know, if not a year or two, to really understand how the data has moved and therefore being able to draw conclusions. Because it's one thing to say, oh, we're going to have more remote work. It's another to understand exactly how much in which industries and in which geographies and which types of companies. And is it full remote work or is it just a flexible work arrangement? Because those are very different implications from a tax nexus standpoint and from an infrastructure standpoint. So anybody drawing any broad conclusions, and this to me is, I hope, the big takeaway of the book is that be wary of anybody making overly broad, over simplistic predictions about the future of work. I was on a podcast the other day and the, uh, the podcaster said, yo, you know, I read a report that said 50% of the US workforce is gonna work remotely post COVID. I was like, that's interesting because only 42% of workers in the United States can work remotely. Most jobs don't allow a remote work construct. Clearly jobs in retail and transportation, in at leisure and entertainment, in manufacturing can't work remotely. And so the United States has a 42% threshold of remote work, which is the largest in the world. And so whoever made that prediction is a moron. <laughs> like, I don't know how else to say it because I get so frustrated because people make predictions outside of data and outside of our bodies of evidence, history of work, the data of work, and how companies actually engage workers. And so my hope is that the conclusion or the big takeaway for people will have is anytime somebody makes a simplistic, bold prediction that is not backed in data, I'm not saying they never come true, although the 50% remote work one I can say will never come true. Uh, I'm just saying be wary. Be wary when people make those predictions. What are they predicated on? What data are you using to make that prediction? Because a thoughtful prediction based on this corpus of evidence, the history of work, the data around work, and how companies engage workers, I'm not saying that those predictions are 100% true either, Peter. I'm just saying they have a higher probability of being true because the world of work is complex and any simple explanation usually belays the complexity that goes into how companies really engage workers. Well, certainly one of the uh, headlines from your interview with my friend Jessica Miller Merrill was just what you were talking about, the threshold of being 42% of the workforce being available to do remote work. And 
I believe you stated that today about 40% of the workforce is working remote, which is like everybody that is capable of doing that. So moving forward six, eight months or a year after there's a some sort of a vaccine or or reason that we can all go back to the offices, what percentage do you think will remain remote versus the percentage that will go back and and work in the office? So just to be clear, 40% was at the height of the pandemic. So that was our kind of June number, if you uh-huh. will. A lot of people have gone back. Uh, you know, I have come up with my number on this. And my number is based on a lot of survey data being done by Gartner, by Deloitte, and a host of other places that are thinking about the future of work in terms of what company executives are saying and what workers are saying. And when you ask workers who wants to go back to the office five days a week full time, you almost get a 0% answer. Now, that doesn't mean that 0% will because it's not entirely up to them as to what they're going to do. If they're again, FTE, yes. <laughs> this is within that 40, those 42% that can work remotely. Uh, but when you ask how many people want to stay completely remote and don't go into the office, you don't get 0%, but you get not above 10. You don't see that many workers that want to stay entirely remote because people are a social animal. We want to be around our fellow people. We want to engage and debate and discuss and catch up and gossip like we want to do that stuff so i actually generally based on the data i've seen i'm getting more and more comfortable with the eight percent prediction that eight percent of the u.s workforce will work in a remote context then definitions are important eight percent in a remote context means more than 50 percent of the time they're not in the office so that is generally to say that from a tax nexus standpoint their home is considered where they work and that has big tax implications And it has infrastructure implications because the companies don't need to necessarily allocate square footage to them. But if you were to ask, and people say, oh, 8%, that's not enough. And I say, all right, well, remember, 8% is out of 42% that can. So that's almost 20% of the workers that could be remote will be. Also remember that 3% was the number pre-pandemic. And so you're talking about nearly a tripling other people working remote. Those are huge, huge, huge changes. But also remember that we're saying remote workers, if you ask me how many workers will have a flexible work arrangement where every other Friday and Monday they don't work in the office, where you know one week a month they are working remote, that is very different. That you may well get into the 30s in terms of the percent of the US workforce having a flexible work arrangement, because that is gonna become much more standardized, which has big implications from transportation, from our home infrastructures, and a host of other things, but maybe not huge implications from a tax nexus or a company infrastructure standpoint, because if I'm still there 70% of the time, you need to have square footage allocated to me. So those are the things that we think about, but That is one of the few future of work predictions that we have a high degree of confidence in because of all the data we have in a very real time as to how this is understood. But I wouldn't pretend that, and I would not be surprised if it ended up at 10% or only at 6%. If it would end up at 20 or I would be shocked if the remote work ended up much greater than that because labor statistics move very slowly. That's one of our huge lessons from the history of work is that things move very, very slowly. And the idea that everybody looks like that is gonna change very rarely happens, save for huge economic dislocations, right? Outside of this pandemic and every company having to put in place the policies, procedures, and change their attitude towards remote work, remote work would have grown from 3% of the workforce to 4% of the workforce over the next 10 years. Very slow incremental change. But because the pandemic forced companies to say, oh, wow, this remote work I've been resisting for so long, it looks like it's actually working. Because companies were forced to put in place the infrastructure, the policies and the procedures to allow remote work at scale. Now that genie's out of the bottle and it will not go back to 3%. That's not gonna happen. Yeah, and I think you know one specific part of the population 
that has benefited tremendously from this is the disabled workers who now can say, not only can I work from home, but I can work from home and be very productive and be more productive than I was when I had to come into your office and try to figure out how to get in there. For anybody that needed a flexible work arrangement for any reason, this has been, I mean, it's hard to say that there are a lot of positives given all of the horror going on uh, in the world, but those are some of the silver linings on that cloud. So you had given us uh, the one takeaway from your book. Uh, What is one takeaway from our conversation that you hope people will remember? I will reinforce this, be wary of people making predictions. You need to think about the history of work. You need to think about the data and you need to think about how companies engage workers because Peter, too much of the conversation around the future of work are driven by very flip statements of, oh, well, companies just want to engage the cheapest worker. Is that a variable in the equation? Of course it is. Companies are going to always be mindful of cost, but to pretend that that's how companies engage workers, it's just, it's just not accurate. And to think about any predictions that are made and just be wary. And so that is the, the main focus of this book. The main focus of my talking about the book is we need to get back to evidence-based conversations in all aspects of life, quite frankly. And in this particular aspect, we have these three powerful drivers of evidence of history, of data, and of how companies actually engage workers. I dive into a lot in the book, and I certainly hope that uh, we've conveyed that here in our conversation. Well, I think we certainly have, and I, I really appreciate your generous uh, uh, time today, and uh, thank you so much for taking time to speak with me. It's, been, it's really been fun to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for having me. It has certainly been fun, and I look forward to talking again soon. Hey, it's Peter Clayton. Please hang on for just a minute. Like most of you, my business was completely upended by COVID-19. Instead of filming marketing, sales, testimonial, and product demo videos at conferences and corporate offices, I'm living on Zoom. Zoom can be an effective video tool for many kinds of powerful content. As people have become more comfortable being on camera and upgrading their video streaming capabilities, we are now able to create high-quality, entertaining, and informative videos using the Zoom platform. Virtual meetings, customer testimonials, product demos, marketing pitches. You'll be amazed at the video quality and the amount of sophistication and graphic complexity we're able to create. For a free consultation on how you can use video to market and promote your business, send me an email, peter at totalpicture.com, and check out totalpicture.com forward slash work. I look forward to hearing from you, and thanks for tuning in.